All right. <clears throat> well, it's a particular pleasure to welcome Howard to Hong Kong, at least to be part of the welcome committee. I was thinking back and I realized that we first met almost the same time that One's Ambitions was founded in Tokyo, going to hear one of the sort of left wing refugees from Yunnan mm -hmm. give a talk, and it really was almost 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's hard to, it's something one doesn't want to admit, but there it is. Anyway, in this distinguished company, including uh, my illustrious predecessor, Eva Hongis, so humbly uh, thank you all for coming. And so, um, before further ado, I think Howard will begin with a few words talking about his history with renditions, which goes back a long way. Thank you, Ted. Um, first, a correction. Um, I am not the only nor the first published translator of Moyen. That was renditions books. Um, collection of short stories called Explosions back in. Do you remember the date? 88 something like 88 that. 88 or something, done by uh, one of the staff at Rendition. So it was a good start. And um, I've done a bunch since then. And I'll talk more about that. As Ted and I will talk more about that. There are always new revelations where Moyen is concerned, so there's a lot to talk about. Um, and I should explain the title of my talk. That was a paper that I was asked to prepare for some lectures in China. Uh, as is usually the case, the title came way before the talk. Um, I was asked to prepare a title, and that's what I put. I thought it was a catch-all phrase that would work. It did OK with the talks. It's not going to do so well today, so put that aside. Um, we are going to chat. Um, Ted's right. We, um, I think we started our careers in the academy perhaps a year after the magazine began. My first job was in 1974. Um, and it was also the time when I published my first translations. One of which, the most important of which, was published in editions in volume four or five, I'm not altogether sure. A short story by Xiao Jun, um, with whom I had uh, I hadn't yet met. Uh, that would come later, but I had done some work with him. Um, over the years, I've published uh, three or four or five other pieces. A couple of really long ones. One really long one after that, a reminiscence of Wu Xu, and a story by a Hong Kong writer. At least one by a Taiwanese writer, and perhaps one by a mainland writer. I'm not altogether sure, but it was always um, a distinct pleasure to get published in renditions. And the longer it went, or the, the, the longer the period, the harder it was to get in. Um, I was fortunate enough to be here at the beginning when the two brilliant editors, uh, George Kao, Chao Jun Kao, Kao Kui, and Stephen Sun Sun Chi, were running the show. And it, you know, for a young, youngish, um, new degree holder just starting out in a career, it was quite fascinating and extremely illuminating to be able to work with two significant literary figures in both West and East. And of course, Stephen Song, as you know, uh, with his uh, connection with uh, Chen Shu and Yang Jiang and his, his, the, the whole Zhang Ailin shtick and, and all that he did. And George Gao was just a wonderful writer, a wonderful man, a great editor, who came up with an average title for the book we finally managed to translate, or I managed to translate it with their significant help by Yang Jiang. Um, they, we, we called it by something about my life down under, with quotation marks, and it didn't work at all. Everyone thought immediately about Australia, and everyone was running to bookstores buying books about Australia, and they got ours by mistake, so that didn't work. Um, but I, I've worked under those two. I was able to do some work under John Binford, um, and I'm not exaggerating the brilliant editorship of Eva Holm, which was actually perhaps the longest editor that is, uh, you've been there longest. Um, just wonderful, and, and, and uh, Eva and at least one other person and I made a trip to Taiwan once, we were working on a special issue. Um, and, 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 and now Ted, so I've worked under all of the editors, missed only the one who will not be missed. And, and <laughs> perhaps you know what that's about. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a wonderful ride, and I'm really pleased to be here on this anniversary, uh, particularly with Lawrence, whom I've known for an awful long time. Um, we always seem to meet our best friends, I guess, somewhere else. Uh, or Tokyo with Ted, Berlin with Lawrence, um, Hong Kong with Eva and David. 
Uh, anyway, uh, I'll stop there. I'm just delighted to be here, and, and, and Ted and I have decided we'll just talk about some things uh, and, and see where it goes. All right, before starting off, I'll just announce shamelessly <coughs> that we're restarting uh, Renditions books, and we're delighted to have the first in the new series is actually Howard's translation of Huang Tunmin's uh, collection of his stories. So it's a wonderful way to start. I'm delighted to be able to announce it today. Okay, <coughs> well, I thought first we'd start talking about uh, some of the, the obvious, and it must feel like now you know how what a rock star feels like when asked to play his favorite or the song that made him famous over oh, and over yes, and over again. So you'll have to talk about Moyen. But first I want to ask you how you chose to sort of spend so much of your academic career on translation. Hard choice to make considering it's not rewarded and in fact it's looked down upon. It's considered something you do in your spare time. Um, how did you decide to do that? Why did you decide to do that? Was it a good choice? Is it something that people can still do? Mm. Yeah, I, 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 I've run into an awful lot of good luck in my life. I've run into some people who have been there at the right time to help me over some tough spots. Um, I have done work uh, at Indiana University for my degree on the Northeastern group of writers. And at the time, in 73, 74, or 73, 74, when I was in Japan writing my dissertation, um, I decided one of the things I needed to do for my dissertation was translate large sections of text from the writers I was working with on, uh, because they weren't available. In fact, hardly anything was available to us when we started out in English. If it weren't for Yang Shen Yi and Gladys Young, and perhaps one or two Isaacs and, and a couple of others who had put together anthologies of literature, the modern period at the time would not have been available to anyone who knew only English. And um, so I decided that I had to do my own, simply because there was nothing else. When I got to Japan, I was asked by uh, uh, the editor of the Chinese Pen, which is sort of the counterpart, the younger counterpart of uh, renditions, if I would be interested in doing a couple of translations, very short pieces. And I said yes. Well, they weren't published first, but they were done first. And I, I really enjoyed the work. I, I, I thought I was doing it reasonably well. Um, I began teaching, and I taught at just the right place. I taught at a second or third tier university, San Francisco State University, and had a dean that said, if you want to do translation, you do it well, and we get something out of it, you'll do just fine here. And so I began thinking about doing more translation at a time when then, at some point, I, I had translated uh, a novel by Xiao Hong, Hulan He Duan. Uh, a brilliant novel, still one of the best novels from that period, I'm sure. It needs to be retranslated, and I'm doing that next year. Um, and, um, and, and a couple of other works got a contract from the Indiana, Indiana University Press to publish them in a new series that Leo Lee and Joseph Lau and Shapter J.C.P. Shah had put together. And um, I was thrilled that I could get something published. Went to Taiwan for whatever research reason and was brought into a project that had just begun under Chinese auspices, the translation of stories by Lucy Chen, Chen Guo uh, the execution of Mayor Yin, the first stories to come out of the Cultural Revolution. And India University said, stop the presses, we're going to publish that first, but we would like you to be involved in the translation, both to get a native speaker of English, to get someone at the university, and to get someone um, who uh, is not associated with Taiwan, Kuomintang, because it was technically sensitive. So I said yes, and that was the first to be published. And for years, I was known as the guy who translated Chen Ruoqi. That was what I was known as. I had done others since then. And the funny thing was, I was only one of the guys. There was another translator who did most of the work. And at one point, she got it, and she was as mad at me as Moyen has subsequently gotten mad at me for people writing about me instead of him. Um, those kinds of things happen, and I, I hate them. So anyway, I was, uh, uh, and I was starting out, and I enjoyed it. So I started translating, and the more I translated, I got tender from uh, uh, translating. I had a book out, but it wasn't much of anything, and, and, and some translations. And I was doing very, very well there, and I said, this is where, uh, this is where my talents lie. 
The other side of that coin is certain kinds of scholarship are not where my talents lie, and so it worked out very nicely. Um, and it's a difficult road for most people. The better the institution, the harder it is for a translator to make it work. Um, my, my advice always to people at these universities is don't translate until you get tenure. Or, if you can get a dean or a chair who would say, you know, a translation of even a modern or a contemporary text that is not your run-of-the-mill fiction, but something much more involved that requires uh, uh, more investigation, more research, uh, actual uh, noting and, and bibliography, if you can get them to accept the premise that this is a tenderable project, then you can kill two birds with one stone. You can get tenure, you can do research, you can also translate. There are many of those, I think, uh, that, that would let that happen. And, and it's too bad, but that's the way it is. And so you need to you know, play the hand you're, you're dealt. Um, so I don't recommend translation as a field, as, 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 a, as a career choice, very often, simply because it's hard to make it in academia. And if you don't get tenure the first time, um, it's tough. To it's tough to keep the career alive. So I, I get them to do, you know, get past the first hump and then do whatever you want to do. Becoming a full professor isn't the only thing in the world that makes people happy, I think. Okay, good. All right, well, that's helpful, I think. Okay. Um, now the question that is unavoidable. Tell us about Moyen, how you discovered him, how the relationship has developed, how you negotiate translation issues with him and whatever else you want to sure, say. Sure. I, I think anyone who, back in the 1990s, picked up a copy of either uh, Hukari Jatso or Red Sword in, in a Viking translation would have immediately known that this was a breakthrough novel, that this was different, that this was something that required notice. And it got lots of notice, both in China and in the West. And it was, unfortunately, the French, you know, you know the French, right? And they, they're always up there right in front. And so they translated the first two chapters of Red Sword, published it, and then co-opted themselves out of a full, a full translation. So the French were the first, but only with two of the five chapters. And then came the English, and it was a blockbuster. It, it did very well critically. It did pretty well uh, in sales. And... Um, and I did fairly well, not financially, but people kind of knew who I was. And so when the second novel came out, which I had read first, actually, but put aside, uh, the Kenasana Tukua, the Paradise, Garlic in Paradise or something, um, it was a different kind of novel, but it too was clearly important. Uh, important in a, in, a, in a much more, I think, perhaps personal, not historical, but contemporary way. And um, Viking Press said, we'd like another novel from him. So I went ahead and translated that. And I'll, I'll speak more about that later if we ever get into another issue. Where I, I'm sure we will, editing and changing works and what have you. Um, and so I did that one. And then Viking bought the third novel, Chill War, uh, Republic of Wine. Not a very good title, but it's what it is. Um, and, and, uh, and they changed their mind after they had contracted. They said, we don't want this novel anymore because the sales were so anemic for the others. And a new publisher came in who fell absolutely in love with Moyen's writing. And he said, I'll take it. And so we published through him a uh, Republic of Wine, a collection of short stories, Shifu, you make me laugh or something, I forget what it is. And um, Big Breasts and Wide Hips, uh, life and death are wearing me out, and and then he died. The publisher died. He was a remarkable man who brought all of these left-wing French, uh, uh, left uh, left bank French writers into America. He worked for Grove Press. He was just brilliant. Then he died, and his independent publishing house pretty much died with him. So they went bankrupt. And we had no place to go. And Moyen and I wondered what we were going to do next. And um, a university press asked me to translate another novel, Sandalwood Death, Tanganyi. And an Indian publisher in Calcutta, I don't think they pronounce it that way anymore, do they? Kolkata. Kolkata. Why do they do that? 
um, uh, asked me if I would translate another, a short biography, autobiography of Moya called Change. Very short. And I said, sure. And then, and then came this novel. I introduced it to him, uh, Lee Paul, which I just called simply Paul. And he published that. And now I've just finished the group, the tenth uh, Frogs, the first post laureate work. And I think my last Moyen, um, I don't know if it will be Moyen's last Moyen, but it will likely be mine. Um, and we have had an interesting relationship. And you always be aware, always be wary of the word interesting, except context, <laughs> I think. We've gotten along fine. Uh, he stayed at my house. Uh, we, we met him in China. We, we met in Los Angeles. We met in Australia. We've gotten along fine. Uh, but as his fame grows, uh, we begin to see the world differently. And um, the Nobel Prize, well, I, before we get there, I, when I asked him questions about things I couldn't quite get my hands around, yeah, they say head around, I say head around, um, and uh, he would go so far as to draw a picture and send it by fax if I couldn't get an image of what this contraption was. Uh, so he was very good about that, and he um, and I, I I learned a lesson. I would ask him, "What does this mean?" And then he would go on and on and on. And then I wouldn't. I, and what I meant to ask him is, "If you were a translator into English, what would you call this?" And of course, he doesn't speak English. So I have subsequently learned, thanks to Sylvia, that when you want to get something from a writer, give him three choices and take one of those, and, and you're probably always going to be okay. Um, but we got along. We've gotten along fine all along, and. Um, he invited us to Stockholm to uh, share with him the, uh, the, the festive occasion, and, and that was wonderful. Um, didn't see him very much because they were kept quite busy. Um, and then he, he came back. We haven't, uh, we haven't spoken since then. And in part, it has to do, I think, with the fact that people are saying without Mayo uh, Kahawin, and Moyen for Mayo is no Mayo Jack. They write that in China all the time. And in the West, they've, uh, people like Wolfgang Kubin are saying, you know, if Goldblatt went out and translated Wang Nai Yi, she would have won the prize. Well, that's just nonsense. Um, but without my translations and the translations of Anna Chen in Sweden and uh, uh, Antel Andre, Chen Andro, is that it? In France and, and, and uh, Patricia Liberati in, in, in Italy and whatnot, or they can't be Italian. But without those three languages, Moyen would not have won a prize, hands down. I mean, they had to read it somehow. One reads Chinese, the other stuff. And they did come to me and say, you know, without your translations, uh, that have been enormously helpful and all. And of course that's true. And so I did play a role, and so did Anna, and so did Antel. Um, but it's his prize, and yet I suspect it becomes annoying to hear that, um, yes, I got three medals, $1.2 million, and shook the hand of the King of Sweden, but people out there are giving this guy too much credit. So I don't know where we're going now. Um, I suspect I won't be translating him anymore, and we probably won't speak again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, actually, the next question, by the way, um, <clears throat> after we finish our conversation, we'll open the floor up to questions. But in response will be in English. <clears throat> so, probably. Anyway, I was going to continue with the Nobel Prize. Tell us what you know about the Nobel and the Bagua, you know. That, that. <laughs> and also, and let's combine it with the response to the awarding of the prize in the Western media, which frankly, I was quite surprised because the New York Times friends attacked him for being not, attacked him as his personality for not being sufficiently outgoing. And I thought that was a little bit beyond the payoff. Yeah. You, know, so. you know, I found out some things about the Nobel Prize having um, been, you know, one of, uh, with 1,300 of our best friends eating dinner with the king and queen. Uh, although we didn't see them, they were too far away from us. Uh, <laughs> so I did learn a few things, and it was quite fascinating. How in the world, in a secret um, gathering of generally old men, um, how do they know who were on the short list? How can they tell? Uh, and it was quite easy. 
Because when they, they someone along the line trims the, the and anyone can nominate if you're a uh, professor, a, a, a literature professor, if you're a former Nobel Prize winner, if you're an editor of the Literary House, there's a large number of people who can nominate. Uh, and uh, you know, we get several nominations and, and they look at it and then they pair it down to a manageable number. And then they get it down to a short list, I think of five, in this case it was. I can't recall who it was. Murakami, William Trevor, who was just wonderful. Uh, Moyen, was it Alice Monroe? No, uh, she won this year, but uh, anyway, two others. Um, I said, how do they know? Lambrooks, they know. Is it Lambrooks? Is that the, the, the odds maker in, in England? Right? How do they know? That these, the booksellers tell them whose books are flying off the shelves with people from the Swedish Academy. They buy all their books to take to give to the people to read so that they'll know who to book for. So they finally figured that out, said we can't buy any more books. So they started photocopying from library books all of the available stuff. Librarians are tattletales. Um, and so they released, they leaked the news. And so the five, from what this one fellow, I forget his name, this old chap, he's a good guy. Um, I forget. Um, uh, what he said, but he said, yeah, they were right. It was these five. But they vote, I'm told, on the day of the announcement. So no one really knows. And they probably have a, you know, they talk, and so they kind of know it's like the Supreme Court, you know, they you know which way they're going, but until they vote, it's not official. I'm told they vote that morning. And that's when, and then they, and, but they have prepared I mean, they've sent people out to create words and terms like hallucinatory realism. I'm sure they had that already, just in case Moya and got it. And then they make the announcement within hours. And then at least once they call me at five in the morning. It wasn't them; it was somebody else. And it was a, a newspaper said Moya just won the Nobel Prize, and I said it's very exciting. And then it was the busiest day of my life, uh, and the happiest day I'm sure it is. Um, and then they, uh, and then on December 10th, the day that Alfred Nobel died, they award the Nobel medals and, and certificate and, and all of that at a really grand ceremony. It's, it's quite remarkable. They have, have a, a wonderful concert the two days before that. They all give lectures, individual, uh, Moyen's lecture. Moyen, probably the first Nobel laureate in literature who gave a lecture no one could understand. <laughs> They had it, they had my translation. And they tried, you know, they started reading and then they just put it down. Because he's reading, he's giving it in Chinese and no one else except these two people from the Chinese embassy and a couple of us knew Chinese. So um, we smiled and laughed at the right places and everyone else quickly smiled and laughed. <laughs> It was fun, and then and then there was a um, and then there was a reception that was just remarkable. It just it's just a wonderful reception, and then the dinner was very nice, and um, and we all came home. And then uh, what was the second? But the response. The response. Yeah, I was I was really surprised. I I knew that there would be people who didn't weren't pleased by his selection for a lot of reasons, including literary reasons. But I was quite surprised to hear damning evidence or damning comments from people who clearly had never read a word that Moyen had ever written, including Kurt Müller, who was coached, we think, by Liao Yu, who was in Germany with her and all that. Um, Salman Rushdie, who called him a party hack how in the world would Salman Rushdie, and why in the world would someone like Salman Rushdie, who has now made a career out of victimization, uh, do things like that? Let me say that. Um, but what, and there were good reviews. There were some good reviews. And then my, our dear old friend Terry Link came out of the New York Review of Books with a, with a totally disingenuous, almost dishonest review of uh, four or five books by Moyen, including books that had already been reviewed in the New York Review. Um, and Perry, whom I've known for a long time, loved the guy, I love his agenda for human rights, his, his support of Liu Xiaobo, his, his inability to get into China, I'm really all behind that. But put it aside, 
and write an honest review of uh, the winner of the Nobel laureate. He didn't do that, and I wrote the letter in response to the New York Review, which they did not publish. But I sent it to Perrick. He read it, and we communicated, and we just agreed to disagree. Um, but I was surprised to see that the, the animus toward a member of the 80 million member Communist Party of China, there's a lot of people, you know, near one, an honorary vice president of the Writers Association to which virtually all writers belonged, maybe some don't now, um, the fact that he only once asked, called for the release of Bill Sharpo, and he probably could have done a lot more. In fact, I think Wayne could have done a lot more in a lot of ways. But that's not why he won the prize, and nor do I think is the reason why he should have been criticized for that. Subsequent to that, uh, we got a couple of m terrible reviews in the British press. I think, I think in the British just hate it. Or some of them do. Or the people who wrote the London Review of Books uh, was a, just a terrible review. And then there was another scathing review by uh, someone else. Um, I can't think of that. And then it's sort of rebuffed by a, an Indian ethnic Indian writer in England, and, and uh, I forget who did that. And then uh, Ian Burma, who has never been called a uh, charming fellow, always willing to give a compliment. He's pretty crusty. And he wrote a really good review of the last two books that were published by Moyen. He said, I had trouble with Moyen's behavior or Moyen's lack of commitment to uh, humane causes, but he wrote two really good books, and they need to be reviewed that way. And then the best review of all was in, a, in, in, a, in a, an online translation journal that you all ought, if you, if you love literature, if you love translating literature, this is one you have to start looking at, called Asymptote. Um, it's, it's a brilliant magazine uh, published out of Taipei, but there are 60 or 70 editors around the world, all volunteer, 100 languages. Um, they publish beautiful stuff. And uh, one of their editors wrote a review of these two, and it's the most intelligent, literate review I think I've ever seen of anything I've ever translated. And, it was, and he too said, but you know, I like Sutoma and Yuma better. But that's me. And the Nobel Committee didn't, then they gave it to Moya. Um, and they gave it to him because he's like a continuer of the Rabelaisian tradition of you know, big, lusty um, uh, novels that uh, deal with uh, sometimes touchy and sometimes kind of unpleasant subjects in very unpleasant ways, uh, very scatological ways. But I mean, no one says, you know, what were Rabelais' politics, folks? So, um, I was surprised and I was, I was displeased, but uh, in the main, I think he's been fairly well treated by the Western press. Oh, I say Western press. I don't know about the French. Um, and I don't know about the other Europeans. They may or may not like him. I know they always translate faster than we do. And, and um, I think with the exception of Moyen, the French always have more translations of all these people out there. So they have a better chance to uh, evaluate than, than I think those of us in the English-speaking world have. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> I think I'll shift the, the area of discussion now to translation, per se. And first, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the issue of, because we are in the Center for Translation Studies, after all. Um, I'm curious your feeling about there's sort of theory of translation and practice. And I, you know, I'm not sure the two fields get along very well, yeah. but I'd be curious if you have to say anything specific about how theory might illuminate practice in the translation field? Uh, nothing intelligent, I, I'm sure of that. Um, I taught literary theory uh, at the graduate level at Colorado a couple of years. Um, but I, it was more an introduction to, because I'd never been, you know, I came at a time when, lit when literary criticism, theory, uh, uh, critical theory was not terribly well known and certainly not by my teachers. So I didn't grow up on theory. I didn't grow up with that mindset of, uh, I mean, I was, you know, they, they were still doing new criticism when I was, when I was uh, in graduate school. And it wasn't new, of course. Um, and 
And, but when I got to Colorado and I was teaching and, and, and my translation career was, was uh, fairly well established, I decided I really needed to look more at theory, at, 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 at the theoretical underpinnings of, or the, uh, the uh, uh, detours leading from the practice of translation in a theoretical way. So I, I, I got uh, David Pollard's editor, that great big volume he edited, which I'm sure why was it, that, that encyclopedia. Yeah, and, and then a whole bunch of other books, some of which came from this university, and, and several came from Hong Kong. And, and then for Lawrence Venuti, and I forget the names of most of the people, and I did read this stuff in Douglas Robinson, and I spoke with him uh, not too long ago. Um, and so I think it's a really interesting uh, field of study, a good discipline. I'm not sure it has a lot to do with what I do, uh, except it keeps me focused on the idea that there's more to translation than just gut feelings and, and, and you know, well, I know this language, I know that language, so I might as well just start working. So it has kept me focused, but I, I don't know of, I know that Lawrence Benuti is a translator as well as a, a theorist. Um, I think uh, Douglas Robinson translates from Finnish, so I'm sure he's good. But the translators I know best, Mike Heim, I hope we have a chance to talk about him in a minute, if not, well, I'll bring it up myself. Um, and um, uh, Edith Grossman and, and um, William Weaver, and Jill Levine, and all of these translators who are, whose names always go on the cover of a translated novel, which means something. I've never seen them write anything about theory. Uh, I've seen them write about translation as a practice, translation as a career, translation as a lifestyle. But they don't write about theory. And if I were to write about translation beyond just the occasional piece, I, I wouldn't either. I think that they need to be kept separate. But they can be kept separate by the same person as long as they're kept separate. Because, like a writer, who gets involved in creative writing courses and you know, writing workshops, and you get very much involved in that, how do you ever actually sit down and write a story? Because every time you put in a line, you say, no, wait a minute, does this follow the rules of uh, narration? Should I be doing this? Did, did I start this and end with a, do I have a side story when I should have gone? To? And you begin asking yourself so many questions you can't write. And um, so I never think about literary theory when I'm translating. Although I suspect I am, uh, there may be some influence there, but probably not enough for me to be terribly um, welcoming to people who want to get me involved in theory. Great. Okay, well actually there's one <clears throat> specific issue, um, the domestication versus mm -hmm. foreignization issue. Okay. Now, is Chinese different from other languages? Isn't it? If you're translating from French, is it more important to, you know, sort of foreignize it than it is from Chinese? Does Chinese automatically foreignize it? Mm -hmm. What's your feeling about that? It's a big issue. Yeah. It is a big issue. Uh, it's one of the things I think about. If that part of theory, then it, then it is part of it. Um, I like to think that I, ni I do neither. I neither foreignize uh, nor nor um, domesticate. I, I just I, I'm I'm just faithful. But then I have to be faithful to what? You know, faithful to the words on the page, faithful to this, faithful to that. Um, and then, and then, I, then I come back and say, you know, we're always probably doing a little bit of both when we translate. A writer should write for his or her readers, not for his or her translators or publisher or whatever, just for the readers. When it comes to me, I have to be translating for my readers. And my readers are not Chinese speakers. My readers are speakers of English. So I need to keep their demands, desires uh, in, in mind. Um, but I find myself frequently saying, now should I translate it this way or that way? One way would be a smoother English, the other way would be a little more to the Chinese side. And I think back to, to Mao Zedong's 1942 talks at Yan'an when he was, he was trying to get his writers to do one of two things. 
either Tikal, bring the peasants up to your level by writing a certain way, or Tutsi, right down to the right of the peasants. What do you choose? Fuji, yeah, yeah. Um, and so writers, it, it, what do we call it now? Dumbing down, often. He, so the writers started writing a more intelligible brand of literature for peasants, some of whom were still illiterate and had to be spoken to. Um, I tried to avoid that. I feel that I do have a bit of an obligation to bring my English readers closer to the Chinese. Um, in other languages, I think it's, it's almost dictated what you're going to do because the, 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 uh, um, the correspondence is already close, French to English, Spanish to English, French to Spanish. Um, so you really don't have a whole lot of choice. You may, you may have some choice. Um, and this brings me to a couple, I'll bring up Mike Heim right now. Um, uh, when Mike Heim was translating Milan Kunda and making him an international figure with the very unbearable likeness of being and, and the book of laughter and, and the jilt and uh, forget the other, um, he was fired by his author, Kunda, for using synonyms. Because he said, when I write in Czech, I use this word over and over, and I want you to use the English word over and over. Mike said, but it doesn't work that way in English. Not to an English reader. It doesn't work. It looks forced. It looks awkward. He said, I don't care. I want it that way. And he said, no, and pff, you're out. Um, and then when he was writing in French, and I have to get Sylvia to help me, when he was, because this was uproarious, when Milan Cordero was writing in French, he had a novel, and, and there was a line in there, is it en fait de pipi ici? And he wanted it to be, he was making pipi here. Well, it works in French, but it doesn't work so well in English. And he said, it has to be there. I want it there. I don't think any Chinese author would, if, if they knew the two languages, would, would say that. So it gives me both some freedom and a responsibility to interpret in such a way as to help bring the readers closer. So that would be foreignization. But in such a way that they don't feel alienated by reading awkward English. And it's tough. It really is tough. But Chinese, because it's so different, um, it gives me a chance to actually think these things out without having to follow the party line, as it were, of, 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 of uh, a text. And I guess if one has to choose, one really needs to come down in favor of one's readers. What do the read which serves the readers better? And sometimes that is, for example, the Japanese do so well with getting their words into English. All of these words, sensei and zen and tofu. Tofu is Chinese, folks, but no, no, the word is tofu. You put tofu, I've had editors change tofu to tofu in a Chinese translation because they said that's what people know. Um, and, and of course the, the European language is French and all, of course, but, but we've done not so well in, in Chinese, but we're doing better. When I, when I broached the subject of the translation of Moyen's short story, Shi Fu Ni Yue La Yue Yong Wo, and um, I said, what am I going to do with Shi Fu? And it's a tough word, it really is. It has lots of interpretations, but none of which really fit, right? And the second half was fun. That was, you'll do anything for a laugh, right? Not quite an accurate translation, but I thought it was good. And the publisher said, why don't we just say Shifu? I said, okay. So that's what it is. And then throughout the text, it's Shifu. And any reader who comes to that book is going to know with, in, in almost no time, that this is a word signifying what it signifies. They may not know it exactly. And I've been reading Indian novels in English. And they're loaded with words in Hindi and Bengali. They're loaded with them, untranslated. And you always know this is not a person's name, it's a food or something like that. So I, I, I try very hard to um, educate the readers without sacrificing um, intelligibility, I guess. <laughs> What's your feeling on the possibility of translating into 
not your mother tongue. Um, you translate into your mother tongue. I know Michael Heim was insistent on you, you wanted, your target language should always be your mother tongue. Although he had a seminar where he had people from all over the world translating into English, which wasn't their mother tongue. So in practice, he was a bit different from his yeah. theory. Yeah, Michael Heim, Mike Heim, uh, the late Mike Heim, yeah, um, a dear friend, and in my view, the absolute best translator uh, of, of that century. <clears throat> Translate for 10 languages, and we spoke 16. And if you ever have a chance, Michael Hunt, A-T-I-M, there, there's a video of him telling you in how he learned Russian, French, Spanish, and German. Each of them in Russian, Spanish, French, and German. And you don't understand the languages, and you, and you keep nodding. Yes, I understand, yes, I understand. He's just absolutely brilliant. Um, and uh, with all of his language competence, he would not translate out of English into one of those languages. And he said that French was his first foreign language, and he thought it was as fluent as English. But he learned it as an adult, <clears throat> or as a late teen. Um, I spent the first 25 or 26 years of my life with a big void. No Chinese. I didn't know anything. And, and those are pretty important years when you're learning a language, when you're becoming uh, comfortable with the language. Um, you learn tone, you learn nuance, you learn uh, allusion, you learn taboos, you learn all kinds of things just naturally. And when you're 26, 27 years old and you're, you're reading and you're trying to figure out what all this stuff means, it's not going to work. So um, I will only translate it in, translate it into English. And I'm told that the United Nations, they will only let you interpret into your native tongue, even though you're absolutely bilingual. I don't know if that's right. But I tried. Um, I once translated a story by Milan Kunda into Chinese with a fellow translator. And that worked fine, because he brought all of that youthful, um, intuitive understanding of Chinese that I didn't have. But once he wrote it, I said, yeah, that's, that's good. And I translated an article of mine, but that was easy. I just kept rewriting it, you know. If I, didn't, if I couldn't translate it, I just wrote something else. <coughs> Lately, uh, sort of like Grandma Moses, I've started writing fiction. Very late. And um, I was asked to send some, trans some uh, I translated a few stories, very short stories for a Chinese magazine. And uh, whew, I couldn't do it. I just simply couldn't do it. It was two pages, and I, I spent hours and hours, and I could, didn't get past line four. And so I sent it off, said, I can't do it. They translated it, sent it back, and I said, oh, it was pretty good. Then I gave it to Sylvie. She said, that didn't look good at all. And then she had to spend hours redoing it. And I realized that I can only be um, functional interpreting this language and expressing it in this language. I can't turn it around that way. Well, thank you. Um, let's see. I'm what? starting to cough. Could we take a, a quick break so I can go cough? For a while? Okay. I, I've had three weeks of cold, folks. This is the last day of my three-week tour, and I'm just exhausted, so I'm going to cough for a while. <laughs> Five minutes or ten? Uh, ten minutes. Ten minute break. <laughs> so there was actually refreshments outside, I think, now. So we'll open it up to the floor for questions from, from you. First, uh, I guess, continuing on the translation issue, what are the prospects of surviving as a literary translator? <laughs> I already know the answer, but... <laughs> uh, you know, if you can do well, um, just a few, um, there are some helpful asides I mean, we don't get paid a lot of money to translate because publishers just aren't willing to spend that kind of money. Um, but there are increasingly numerous other sources. Um, there are prizes that are given out. There are uh, grants, awards. Um, they just opened up three years, three, four years ago, they opened up the, uh, the Guggenheim, uh, Guggenheim Translation Award. Uh, Edith Grossman got one, I got one. Um, I think someone else, I, some, I, another uh, Spanish translator has just gotten one. So they said translation is important enough that it needs to be set aside from, 
from the, the, uh, the, the critical the writing uh, award. There are awards given out by the uh, uh, American Literary Translators Association, the PEN. Um, but ultimately, you pretty much have to keep your day job. You, you, you likely will not, you can translate one book every, what, maybe six months, and if they're books from China, maybe eight months, because they tend to be really big. And if you're paid $10,000 to translate a book, you do one and a half books a year, you're, you're poverty line in America. So it is difficult, and there are other, there are other sources of income, as I, as, I, as I indicated, but for the most part, academics continue to be the majority group of translators in America, and I don't know what it's like in, in the UK. There are some, Edith Grossman, for example, is doing quite well translating, uh, Robasa did well translating, Jill Levine, Jill, Jill Levine is still teaching. Uh, so yeah, you knew the answer going in, and I just uh, confirmed that. But it's getting better. The, the amount of money paid to some translators is increasing as the sales of certain authors increase. So uh, uh, I didn't do very well with Moyen simply because I translated all of these books before he got the Nobel Prize. I mean, it was a foolish mistake. <laughs> But that's the way it was. By the time I translated eight of his works, I think, nine of his works, uh, he was just another writer, a good writer, a writer who was well received by the critics and by some readers. But um, he didn't sell very many copies. And since he got the prize, I'm told he sold 60 or 70,000 copies of his books from one publisher, which is a lot of books for a Chinese translation. But that's one year. It won't happen again next year. And Alice Monroe ought to be ready to have one good year. <laughs> and, then, and then the chances are it's going to drop off. We have short memories, and we like to buy our latest Nobel laureate's work to see what it's all about. And that's good. So the answer is uh, the prospects are great. But if you like translating as much as I like translating, you really ought to find a way. Yeah, this is a related question. I just a uh, couple of weeks ago read that, what, the Robert Bologna book, the 2666. And I was reading, I thought the translation was just stunningly good. And I was trying to find some information about the translator. Nothing. I barely found her name. Natalia Wimmer. Yeah, Natalia Wimmer. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, but in the book itself, oh. nothing. Oh. And I was thinking, you know, what... Is, that doesn't seem quite fair. Is there, any, is there any movement to sort of upgrade the status of the translator? Or, or yeah, more and more publishers are willing to put a translator's name on the cover. Some translators. I mean, I have, to, I have to qualify this always. Not all translators are going to be able to get that. You really have to get your creds, you know? You have to get your street creds. You have to do enough that people kind of know who you are. But they are willing to put your name on the front cover. It used to be that they wouldn't even put your name anywhere but on the copyright page. Now that seldom happens. There will be the name of the translator on the title page, maybe on the cover, and frequently on the back cover, uh, which is why my friends always go into bookstores and turn all of my translations around so the back is facing out. Um, one of them had a blurb by Stephen King and so I made sure that no copy of that ever had the front cover out. They always had, I wanted people to maybe think they bought the latest Stephen King novel, and by the time they got home, read it anyway, or something like that. Um, but blurbs about the translators are usually only given for really established translators, or someone who's famous in some other way. There are some, there are some people who, um, I don't know if Elliot Weinberger is primarily a translator or primarily a poet or what, but he, he'll always get one, probably, I think, because he's a poet and he translated Octavia Paz. But, but, so it does happen. Publishers in America and in the UK uh, have been slow to do this, but they're doing it a little bit more now. Okay. Yeah, then there's a related question. It's famously, the United States has a really poor, it's, tough ground for translation. Very few translations are published as a percentage of the 
total numbers of books published in the United States. You mentioned that France, I'm always surprised seeing the, the Qing novel that I'm talking about. No English translation even on the horizon, but it's fully translated into French, even though you know, French won't want to hear this, but it's a less significant language in English in terms of numbers. You know, so do you have any and the other thing is that you know Chinese writers writing in English sell better mm -hmm. than translations in spite of the, in spite of the fact that the quality of the work isn't necessarily as good. Yeah. Are there, do you have any sort of insight into that phenomenon? Insight, no, I think. But I have some figures, I think. Yeah. And and what um, gosh, I forget his name, the head of NEA, the, he gave a talk at the Alta Literate Gathering a couple of years ago, and he. He gave a figure of 3% of published books in America are translations. That's a, that's a really low number. I don't think it's climbed at all and may even be worse now because more and more books are being published and more and more of them are being help, you know, help, help, book, uh, uh, help books, uh, how to do this, how to do that, and, and a lot of nonfiction. So I would guess that uh, the numbers maybe are still holding steady at about 3%. In, in European countries, the numbers are much higher. And I'm told that the Italians are at about 50-50. But I think that's in part because so much English literature is translated into, into all of these languages. But they do translate from each other's language. And the Italians are great at reading translated literature. And I think others are as well. I think the Chinese in China and in Taiwan, uh, not as clear in Hong Kong, but I'm assuming it's the same, uh, are good readers of, of translated literature. And they tend to be far ahead of the quality of the translating uh, translations themselves, I think. And uh, that's improving, I'm told, that more and more translations are being uh, upgraded. The more translators are, are, are doing more. You know, we have at least three translations of Ulysses. So uh, the Chinese readership is there. I think Americans just don't trust translations. And I think there's a sort of exceptionalism in American society that says, you know, if you want to write a novel, you Italians or you French, write them in English. Why would you want to write it in some other language? I, I, that, I mean, it may sound funny, but I think that's sort of the mindset. I think the Americans just don't trust translations. It's not buko chen. And I don't know what to do about that. I, nothing I can do about it except keep translating. But uh, one would think that with all of this news about Nobel Prizes and all, people would say, well, listen, if Moyen is such a good writer and I don't read Chinese, maybe I have to read the translation. And, and so that's, that's the best I can come up with as a, as a reason for it. I, I, I really don't understand. But the number of topics on which I don't understand Americans is so great that translation is not going to, I'm not going to answer that one in a big hurry. Now in the UK, perhaps I can, are they, does it, do they do better, you think? No. Um, I see a familiar face over here, someone from my Indiana day who used to be a, an editor at a publishing house of some significance. Do you see anything? Do you know? No. <laughs> so, um, it, it, it's not a good it's, it's not a good picture, but it's uh, we keep at it. There are a few houses that virtually that that, that publish almost nothing but translations. There's Dalkey Archives that publishes almost well seventy five percent. Modernist works, avant-garde works, really difficult but good literary works they publish in translation. There's a new publisher, um, maybe three, four, five years old, called Open Letter out of uh, Rochester, University of Rochester. Uh, Chad Post is the editor, only translations. And he publishes like 20 or 30 or 40 translations of novels and short stories and plays every year. And they get really good. Uh, the New York Review of Books publishes a whole series of translated literature. So there are, there are publishers that are very interested in bringing world literature to American English-speaking audiences. And they're to be commended. And if they don't get the big share of the pie, that's OK. I have one final question. This is about the Chinese literary world. It struck, struck me 
more than once reading a Chinese novel that there's, a, there's an obvious difference, I think, between the role of the editor in American publishing and in Chinese publishing. The editor is a serious figure who doesn't, who may be overworked, but certainly has time to do serious editing. My sense is that in China, the editors have far too much to do. They're young, they tend not to have much authority, so they really can't, uh, you know, sort of do much in terms of alterations to the text. So I can name a number of novels that would have been much better if they were 30% shorter. And, okay, that's one thing. I mean, is there anything, what, what's your feeling about that? As a translator, how do you work with that issue? Okay, good. Uh, it's a question I'm asked, or ask myself a lot. Um, you know, there was only one Matthew Perkins, so I mean, even in America, we don't, but I've worked with some really spectacular editors. Um, Nan Graham at Viking, uh, Sarah Burstell at Metropolitan, um, I forget his name, who did All Eyes, what was All Eyes? Anyway. Um, and, 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 and then I've had some who will let me get away with anything and then say, but can we move the comma from here to there? And I have to say, won't you please look at my prose a little more discriminately because I need help. I, I, I always need help. My translations always come out better when they've been seriously edited. We fight, we argue. Um, again, Mike Heim, Mike Heim once got on a plane and flew to New York from Los Angeles to confront an editor with whom he was having trouble. And he won. Um, so, you know, editors, editors have a lot of authority in the, in the United States, and I'm sure in many of the Western countries. They have a lot of authority because they tend to, they work for the publisher, they know what the publisher's needs are, they know what a book needs to make it better. I'm afraid that more and more of the editors at some of these houses are recent MFAs from Ivy League schools, not even Ivy League schools, the, the Seven Sisters, perhaps, the, you know, these, 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 these uh, um, what do you call them, schools? And uh, they tend to be quite priggish. But you can't say that. He said, I just said it. They said, but we can't do that. Why can't you do that? Because the Chicago Manual says you can't do that. Well, forget the Chicago Manual. But the, the system is in place. Uh, Western editors are an important mediator between translator and publisher, or between author and publisher. And in China, it just isn't the case. Chinese editors are not uh, well paid, they're not well thought of, and they have no authority in almost all cases. And when I, the first, my first meeting with Mulya was in a, a restaurant in Beijing, and uh, he didn't get along very well, but, but that would change. And his editor was there and gave me a copy of uh, Fung Lu Pigment. And she said, uh, uh, I Not a word. I mean, my goodness, what's this editor to do? I can't change a word. But that's what he said. And he had enough authority at that press, so that's what happened. They desperately need editing. Um, if for no other reason, to, to, to as, as Ted has said, to pare it down a bit, get rid of backstories in the middle of the denouement, for example, <laughs> why would you do that? Why would you just move a reader in a new play? Um, but some things are changing. We know of one writer who interestingly, published a book and now has sent it to an editor to edit for possible translation. So it's a little long out, a little, you know, put the, put the cart before the horse, but still it's being done. And then we met a very influential publisher in Beijing, a fellow we've worked with on two or three novels, a couple of writers. We were talking and he said, so-and-so, this writer, um, gave me the novel, and it was really, really good until the ending, and the last chapter was terrible. So he called him in, and he said, the last chapter stinks. I won't publish this book with this chapter. So he went back, rewrote it, brought it in, and the guy said it was fine. So it may not be the editors now, it may be the publishers, who themselves tend to be literary figures, who read these and have demands, because they're the ones who are putting the money into the, into the book. 
Um, the second half of your question, or the implication, was, uh, 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 how do how do we deal with editors here uh, in America, or in, in, where, in where I translate, or, uh, or or the ones in China? Well, we don't deal with the ones in China because by the time we get the work, it's already been done. And my mantra is: translators translate, and editors edit. Editors should not translate and translators should not edit. Although I'm editing all the way through this as I'm going along, particularly the Chinese. I'm, 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 you know, I'm editing. Uh, but what is being bandied about now, particularly in my name and, and others, is that I am cavalierly taking a meat axe to these works, chopping them up, getting rid of things I don't like until they become Howard's favorite book. And this is it's just not true. When, um, when a book comes to me, I translate. I translate everything. That's my job. I'm being paid to translate everything. Even those things I think may be better left either untranslated or differently written. But that's not my call. It is the publisher's call in America because the publisher bought the rights. The publisher owns the book. And frequently, the, the editor will come and say, we got a problem here. We don't like such and such. One of them, uh, a book that I did a few years back, got a lot of play in China, and even got a review in the National Geographic. I feel really good about that. And, and, and the editor came and said, Howard, this is a great translation. We love the book, and we love everything you've done. We think it could be a little shorter. We're thinking like maybe take out, we'll say, a third. <laughs> Honestly, I still have the letter. One third. And I, I went to the author and I said, guess what? They love a lot of your book. <laughs> Not all of it, obviously. And uh, he was okay with that. Because much of the third was a sort of tack on at the end. But they said also there was an epigram. It, it's wolf totem, in case you're interested. It's long to talk. Everyone knows that. Um, Every chapter had an epigram from some classical text that had the word wolf in it. And there were about 40 of those, with absolutely nothing to do with the chapter, nothing to do with the novel, it had the word wolf in it. Da 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 da, long, And so the, the publisher said, can we scrap those? And I said, I'm, I'm on board with that. So we went to the publisher, the, editor, the author, and the author said, okay. Then later, the author and I had a public conversation in China. And um, I won't go into that. We had, a, we had a dispute. And he told me, he said, I didn't mind one of them, but, but I was really unhappy that you took the epigrams out. So I didn't tell you anything out. They did. He said, I would like them back in in the next edition. So I said, talk to the publisher. We, I have them. You know, I put them in a, in a lockbox. I put them in my safe at home so no one will get to my collection of wolves. And, 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 and I said, I'll give them back to you, but I, 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 don't think, you know, I don't think they're necessary. But let me tell you a couple of things that have been done that I think worked well. And, well, the first one had to do with Moyen. When Moyen wrote Ten Thousand Swan Chico, The Taste of Garlic in Paradise, I forget what it's called. Um, he wrote a, a very angry novel because of things that had happened in his hometown to the peasants by the officials. It's a really strong novel. And um, he wrote, 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 wrote. And, and Moyen is the sort of person who writes his novels in his head. I mean, really writes them in his head. And then when it comes time to put them on paper or a computer, it's like three days, five days, 40 days, and it's done. So my feeling was that when he got to the last chapter, he didn't, he kind of was, he kind of lost interest. He, he, the venom had been spewed, the, the heat was gone, you know, the push was out. And so he, he sort of wrapped up the novel with a 20th chapter that was nothing but newspaper articles dealing with where these officials were reassigned or fired or something. And uh, Sarah Burstell said, Howard, we need help on this. Can we do something about this? This, this, this last chapter is going to kill us. I said, okay. So I went to Moya and I said, I uh, didn't say it quite like that. I said, but you know, some of the not, some of the characters needed perhaps to be wrapped up a bit. I mean, we don't know what happened to any of the characters. So they, they just sort of were lost. 
And in, I think, two or three weeks, he sent me a brand new chapter, handwritten, 20 pages. It was great. I translated it, sent it to the publisher. She loved it. It came out. Everyone liked the book. In all subsequent versions in the Chinese, the new chapter has replaced the old chapter. So there was a case of collaboration that worked. And I think Boyan himself says, you know, it's a better book now because of this. He, he still wrote it. I didn't do it, but he still wrote it. But we kind of urged him to maybe do something else. There was another, another novel I translated. And I'll tell you which one that one is, to Cell Phone, Shouji by Lorraine. And it's a, it's a good novel. It's a fun, enjoyable, good read. But it starts 30 years ago. And, I, and, and the agent said, Ooh, I don't know if we're going to be able to do that. How many Americans want to start with a novel that starts 30 years ago in a Chinese mind? And I said, it didn't bother me. And she said, yeah, but you're not, you're not typical American reader. What can we do? So I, I looked, and in the second chapter, there was one three-line bit that said something like that he walked out of the courthouse, he was now divorced, and he didn't know what just hit him. Contemporary. I moved that to the beginning, set it in the present, and then the back story was the past. And it just traveled along. You'll drink in the final that. And I think it worked. So those kinds of things, I think, are worthwhile. Look, literature, in my view, is one of the great wonders of the world. But the written word is not necessarily sacrosanct, I think. Literature is also a commodity. It's like, you know, cars and hamburgers and things like that. It's you produce some and consume. And no one blames Burger King for putting something other than beef into their hamburgers they, because they have a new audience in Pakistan. I mean, it's poor. Um, I forget which one of and, and, and no one blames uh, uh, Buick for changing the way the car is sold in China, for example. That doesn't mean that you can just do whatever you want in the future. But I think having a new target consumer does make a case for keeping that consumer's needs and, and, and background in mind when you do the work. I always check with my author to make sure it's okay. Few of my authors read and understand English, so I have to kind of spoon feed it. And a couple of them have regretted it. They wish they hadn't listened to me or listened to the editor. That's okay. Um, and with one exception, we're still good friends. The other guy hates me. He thinks I ruined his novel. He thinks I just destroyed his novel. He went out and asked two guys he knew who knew some English, and they said, no, he didn't do this, he didn't do that, he translated this word as that. This whole sentence has become something different, and he thinks I ruined his novel. And I, you know, I, I'm thinking of writing to him and say, I did not ruin your novel, but he won't believe me. <laughs> and it's still a good novel. So, is that the... Wonderful. Right, now open the questions to the floor.